So it's it's great to see everybody. I think in terms of just housekeeping, I think that we've got uh, a, an appropriate enough size group that folks can just raise their hands or just jump in as they have questions. So, so introducing Beth, I asked Beth if she had a, a short bio and she, um, she said, no, just tell folks that I'm a lawyer, baker, international bagel consultant. And then went on to say that what she really does is, is teach entrepreneurship. But what I've learned about Beth is before she arrived at Bates, she grew up in Williamstown where she developed this entrepreneurial spirit, maybe through her family. And then when she came to Bates, she was a poli sci major and then went on to law school. And together with Tim, they've had this circuitous path that's gone in all sorts of directions. And then in terms of the bagel business, in some ways, this really started with Spencer. He was maybe a catalyst uh, to, to what ensued. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Beth. And I think really as, as part of the conversation, everybody should, should just chime in with questions, comments, whatever. <laughs> so hi, everyone. So um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so currently I'm going to start what I'm doing currently and then kind of go back in time. So, you know, to call what I've done an empire is not quite right, <laughs> but I help, I have created something that isn't going to make me a billionaire, though it could turn into something more than it is. But I've created an unfranchised concept. Um, and I'll explain why I've gotten into that. But I started making bagels. Well, Tim and I, did, I started making bagels and Tim and I started a business in 2008 uh, called Spelt Right. And it was based upon bagels. And it was, and I was practicing law full time as a child advocate attorney at that point. And our son, Spencer, who is now a chemical engineer and, you know, just we think he's great, um, always has been great, but he had a bunch of uh, health and behavioral issues that were really impacting his ability to function as a young human. And um, because I was in the child advocacy world and I saw what was happening with a lot of kids in that world, sorry, sorry about the cat, um, that I decided, and, and Tim went along with this, but it was really, I just could not the concept of putting him on Ritalin or something just didn't sit well with me. And part of that was because I, we could see him just being very lucid, clear, brilliant at times, and then other times just losing it. So just very quickly, you know, over a period of three years, I just started really um, researching and we were ultimately able to determine that his gut was messed up. And if we could clean up his gut, it would impact his brain. And what he couldn't eat um, and still really can't eat without a lot of digestive issues, though he is not celiac, is wheat. So now here I'm making all these bagels, but, he, but he's not celiac. So he could eat ancient grains and artificial colors, flavors, preservatives. And I was telling our youngest daughter, because she, she's getting into public health, and she was talking to me about some theories and things. And I was telling her that even though she doesn't know it, I kept a chart of him for three years, uh, what he ate behaviors, like all these things. So I was explaining to her that I, he was basically a singular clinical study. And I was, a, we were really able to determine what worked for him and what didn't. And then I started researching and it wasn't so odd, actually. It wasn't like he was the only kid in the world. It was many, sorry, I knew she would do this. Hey, when you go see dad, go see Tim. Um, so um, at some point, we realized that we just had to change everything. And Sue knows this well, because I started kind of echoing this out to my friend group. But we went through our kitchen and we threw away everything. We threw away everything, anything that had hydrogenated oils, yellows, reds, anything that reeked of highly processed. I mean, all food is processed. And wheat also. And we did a like a mini um, elimination diet. And we were really able to pinpoint what bothered him. And once we cleaned it up, we also brought him to nutritionists and doctors who were able to help us do metabolic testing, found out that his B levels were low. So we just really took care of him. And he, we pulled him out of public school because it was a disaster and uh, put him back in public school. So we pulled him out uh, after first grade, put him back in in fifth grade 
And then we get a phone call from the school and I'm like, oh God, like back off, what's up? And basically we got a call and said, you know, he's highly gifted. And we're like, yeah, we knew that, but he also is highly sensitive. So they put him in a great program for three years, uh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And part of the reason why we moved to New York in ninth grade is because there wasn't enough math and science there for him. But kind of back in time, now Spencer's in the position where he can't eat any fun foods, apparently. You know, no, we're not going to McDonald's. We're not going out for pizza. We are not eating like the average American family at this point. So I decided at first I was going to learn to make candy and other things with all natural ingredients. I was, because I didn't want to isolate him. I just wanted him not to be well. And I got a lot of criticism from parents, like you're going to do something, you're going to mess up your kid. You know, what's this? I'm like, you don't understand that there is something bigger going on here. So one day when he was eight years old, I can, I can picture the exact moment. I said to Spencer, this is, we're going to make this fun. Like we have to change everything, but I knew I could bake with spelt and he was not reacting poorly to it. So I said, what are you missing most in life? And he said, a bagel. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make the best bagel I can ever make just for you. And we make it. It took me about, I have this Lebanese cookbook where I actually have the recipe on the back. And um, it took a few tries, but when we finally got it, or I finally got it right, he gave me two thumbs up. And I just knew I was on to something. So then we ended up going to a few parties, bring the bagels. And at one of the parties, there was a woman who was a, um, she was a forager for the old Whole Foods, right? And she's like, hey, you know, you should really bring this product to Whole Foods. So Tim and I were like, okay, let's take a home equity loan and build a factory and make bagels. It was the <laughs> stupidest thing <laughs> that anybody could ever do. So this is what I advise people against, but we build this bagel factory and we win like best of Maine from, from uh, Down East Magazine. We're in Hannaford supermarkets and then, um, we're also in like Beth, you have a question there's yeah. a, some chuck is asking yeah. a question oh i'm not doing my job thank you yeah what's the chuck go ahead where's the chuck? so yeah beth so um did you go from cooking in your kitchen to building a factory or did you get one of those you know industrial things did you just go for did you go oh no, we built a factory we got equipment we went into like a two thousand square foot space brought in industrial equipment it's the same stuff i use now i got in your kitchen you went to a factory yeah, it was it was so stupid. Like, don't <laughs> so so this is this is kind of where I am now. I'm like, don't do that. You know, I tell people like, don't if you want to, you know, throw your life in a mess. But I did buy the equipment from this company, and <laughs> there were like three companies making bagel equipment. And I bought mine from one of them, and I got to know the people there pretty well. And um, you know, I I. When I would tell one of the Frank, who's who was a business partner with me for a while, that um, oh, like this is before I told him, hey, I got in Han to Hannaford Supermarket. And he's like, you're a virgin in a whorehouse. You're gonna get screwed. And he was so right, you know. But I was so proud that I could just like, oh, Whole Foods wants my stuff. And never was I really running those spreadsheets to figure out are we gonna make money off of this. So through pure circumstances we get an offer basically the guy who actually owns excalibur had to um he he made a lot of money off of a building he made 5.5 million off of a building and he had to flip and buy another building so he while i'm ready to leave you know having my factory in maine they, they're like hey we have a building <laughs> <laughs> and we can put the bail, you know, the bail equipment. We can try spelt right here for a year. That was, and they gave me a one year, like, hey, you can be here for a year. It's been 12 years, so I really have to leave now. But I built, we built a spelt right factory there. And then we had partners who were Orthodox, Jewish, East New York, who bought, who didn't buy the business. They basically invested in it and brought it to East New York. So spelt right kept living beyond its useful life like we that business was in business for more than eight years and it probably should have shut down after three and but now we're in new york tim is working at the master school our kids are doing really cool things in new york city so we take them from scarborough maine to upper manhattan again kind of crazy um 
we, and in the process, I know Spelt Right is going south. And so I decide to get my bar in New York and I start practicing law here a little bit. And then, um, and then Frank said to me, you know, I sell bagel equipment all over the world and you know a lot now between that business you ran, all these very specialized spreadsheets that you create. He'd never seen anything like that. Most people don't do that with bagels. Why don't you become a bagel consultant? And I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's create a website. So we do this and, you know, we get three or four clients a year and it's nothing too spectacular, but I was really focused on how shitty the bagels were in New York. I'm sorry, New York, but um, and what it was is I was able to go into the backside of bagel shops because I had an insider who who put in all this equipment in these shops. And I was seeing, you know, the yellow dyes that freaked out Spencer, the red dyes, the high fructose corn syrup. And I'm like, why is all this stuff in bagels? Like, what is going on? So I just, I had this whole bakery that I could just use. And so I said, I am going to make the best all natural bagel there is, and I'm going to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. I know it sounds strange. So I start just playing with this and I don't get a lot of business in the US, but I started getting business from people in Ethiopia and in, uh, let's see, the first ones were Sweden, Australia, Ethiopia, Paris, and the Bahamas. I mean, it was kind Beth, of- how did they hear? how did they hear about you? How did so they- the first- originally they started hearing about me because people would go to Excalibur and say, Hey, you know, we want to put in a bagel shop. And Frank would say to them, you know, you really need a consultant. I know somebody uh, because people were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this equipment with no plan and no idea how to make this. Um, then, then I just started getting a reputation. Like people would know, or they would see a shop go in and like one of the shops we did was, um, Goldilocks bagels in Medford, Mass. And so then I didn't realize how close um, uh, Black Sheep Bagels is, but they're on Harvard's campus. And like during COVID, they lost their supplier. They weren't making their own bagels. And so I get a phone call like, hey, we, we found out that you do bagels. Can you teach us remotely? Here's our situation. And, and so I started getting very creative in the way I was teaching people. But as this was developing, I started to realize people do not know how to set up their spaces and they don't know how to do the business side. So <laughs> I was telling David, one night I went to sleep and I had this idea for these spreadsheets on how to show people what the money looked like. It was very bizarre because now when I try to rebuild these web these spreadsheets, I look at them, I'm like, who, who made this thing? <laughs> because it's pretty <laughs> complex. But I started with 250,000 gross, which is, there's no way you can survive on that. So I went from 500,000 to 2 million gross. And then I built these calculators to show, you know, people say, well, how much money do I need to make? I'm like, well, let's, we, we've got to figure that out. And so what I do is I say, how many days are you going to have your business open? So just say it's 335 days. And you're picking the million dollar, not the 500,000 or the, you know, millions easy. So we know that you have to bring in $3,000 a day and that will get you a million five. Now, what can you do with that million five? You can go broke with that or you can make money. And so then I started researching and the rule of thumb in restaurants is no more than 8% of gross for occupancy costs. So I built a calculator for that. So put in your rent and let's see where that falls in that category. And then I mean, we wonder why restaurants go out often. It's because they don't, they spend too much money and it is what happens. And so the other rule of thumb and a lot of it's rule of thumb for um, restaurants is that they can't spend more than 35% of gross for labor and 35% for cost of goods. But you look at that, now you're at 78% and you still haven't covered your POS, something, you know, some shit hits the fan, some other, you know, your, your um, utilities. And by the end of the day, maybe you're left with 3%. So I'm, I'm saying this is why businesses fail. Now let's take this calculator again, and let's put it at 25% and 30% 
on each because I can't tell you what those other ones are. You know, you, we're going to have to keep those expenses within line. We have some guess. And as we started playing with these calculators, we would see that if you went from 25% each on the cost of goods and the um, the cost of goods and, and labor costs and the 8% for your space to 35%, if you kept that at 25%, you're bringing in 200,000 more per year. And all of a sudden you see that you can make money. So, so then people would say to me, well, how many employees can I have? I said, we have to talk about how many employee hours. So again, I went into one of these calculator modes and I'm like, okay, how many employee hours can you afford? What is 25% of a million? And then we would, and then it would break it down per week. So ask me to build the spreadsheet again. And I probably couldn't mm -hmm. in the moment I could. And so we're able to then break it down how many full-time employees or half-time employees you can have. So, so, and then people say, well, how do I make a million dollars? I said, well, let's go back, you know? So interestingly enough, you don't have to have a ton of bagels to make a million dollars. You have to really have these sales. So again, this is just basic algebra. And we go, and I built these calculators that if you had a hundred turns, a hundred people come in, now, you know, you can have more than that at, you know, at Tufts University, but hundred people, well, then you've got to get a $30 sale. So let's get 200 people at $15. There's your 3000 a day. Now, how do you sell? How do you make that 15? So we start pricing out what things should be. And so with the bagels, now the bagels I make are really kick-ass. They're really, really good, but they're not necessarily the same for everybody because we can, they get adjusted based upon the equipment that we source in and the space that you have. So I have the ability to shift the way that these bagels are made. Um, but, but what we see, you know, and I say to them, if you can, you make 500 bagels and you make $5 off of each one of those bagels, say that's selling coffee or whatever, that's $2,500. But now let's look at making $10 off of each of them. Now you're bringing in 5,000. And that's that's a pretty hefty amount because if you're open 300 days, that's 1.5 million. So all of a sudden, it, it's no longer theory. It's really, we can see how the money is made. And Beth, so- I, I, ha I have a really basic question for you that maybe is gonna embarrass me, but no. how, how much does the, does the, sort of cost of real estate in a particular region make a difference? I mean, I live in San Francisco. You're talking about New York, very expensive real estate. My clients who, like I have a client up in Waterville, she makes more money than anybody, than the people in New York because her place didn't cost anything. I mean, she paid mm -hmm. like 130,000 cash for the building and then improved it and that was it. So everything that's coming in is great. Now I have two people talking to me about New York and I am saying to them, don't do it. Like your rent's going to be at least 12 or $15,000. And then it, and then it's about $500,000 to build the shop, you know, from the ground up. Hmm. Uh, it can be less kind of an irony. We're building one in Brooklyn and it's for a nonprofit and they're spending more money than anybody would ever spend on building a bagel shop. Um, because it's a nonprofit, we kind of just gloss over the fact that this is not a reality job that we're doing, which I find kind of disturbing. Um, but yeah, the cost of real estate's great. That's why I'm looking at maybe putting in a place in upstate New York where I can buy a building um, because you put in a lot of money into the infrastructure for the building. It needs what's called three-phase power, which is a very powerful electrical load. You need, you know, at least like four or five hundred thousand BTUs of gas minimum. You need all sorts of things, you know, and then <clears throat> all of this. So when people say to me, "Oh, I just want to put in a bagel shop," I'm like, "Do you have five hundred thousand dollars?" And then they're like, "No, no, I have a hundred thousand. I'm like, "It's just not gonna. It's it's not gonna do it." Um, do you get involved in guiding them on getting uh, financing, or is that? <laughs> I don't. I mean, you know, maybe at some other stage I may, but right now it's really people who can either family's going to fund them or they have a lot of people from finance are doing this now. So mm -hmm. they had a little nest egg 
I have one guy who worked in the oil industry. He's, I don't know, 50, maybe. I don't know how old he is. Uh, he opened a place in Woodford's uh, right in Houston. He was scared. Like, <laughs> and he told me he brought in, he wasn't open every day, but he told me he brought in, you know, like three quarters of a million. He was able to pay off everything and bring home about 25% of that and then only work one day. And I'm like, that's a great model. Like, maybe I should hire you to help me <laughs> to be able to do this. But um, so like, I would never, personally, I would not go and rent a place and build a bagel shop because, it, you know, unless you're, you, you got a five-year lease with an option on it, even then you're just, you, you, you put so much money into the place, unless the place is going to produce, you know, a million and a half a year. So, you know, I talk people out of, hiring me a lot of the time is, and it's not, you know, I could convince them to just pay me and, and my fee structure is strange. Um, I license everything I do. It's all under confidentiality. They cannot teach or share uh, with their employees. They have to put them under an NDA also. I mean, I can't guarantee all this, but we try to put in these le levels of protection. And then I charge a one-time fee, which is like a franchising fee. And if they open other stores, I get a one-time fee off of those stores. I was going to, I tested out doing mini royalties like for three years and it just turned people off. They did not want to do it. I mean, the French, and, it, and it's not a franchise if I do that, but they, you know, and I, and I didn't feel comfortable with it. And then if they end up selling their business within a 15 year period, I get 2% of gross. So the, the very first client I worked with sold for $34 million and I didn't have that clause in there. So that's when oh, I learned. Are these the Shark Tank folks that you yeah. mentioned? Yep. And so, um, so, and I look what at- What about the Shark Tank folks? Yeah, they were Bantam Bagels is what they were called. And they did these little bagel balls. It's interesting because they got bought out really fast and then they got divested within three years. I mean, they made their money, but other people really lost- in the process. Um, but I, I'm reading this book, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's Ron Tite is the author. And I think it's, it says, think, do, say. And he does talk about, you know, multi-billionaires and, but I like what his message is. And it's really that you, you know, you have to really believe in what you do you have, you have to think about it, you have to do it, and then you have to let people know you're doing it. And so for me, you know, what I believe in, I love small businesses. And I think small businesses are just a dying breed, mostly because it's, it's very difficult to start a business and they're, and the franchise model is just out there. And I think that franchises and my personal belief <clears throat> in the world are just killing creativity and also our health, you know, nobody really cares what they're selling. The whole goal, I mean, I've had people come to me and want to franchise or talk about it. And then I just go, no. And then, you know, and maybe I'll regret that because I'm not going to be sitting on this pot of gold at the end of all of this, or maybe it won't end. It's just going to keep morphing. Um, but I, I really love the idea of getting people into a business that they run. And when these people are running their businesses, most of them, 80% of them are running them. A few are have passed them off to managers and I'm likely not going to take on clients like that. And it's not that they're there every day, but they are involved in their businesses. They have brought, brought such value to their communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and when you go out and you're like, where are we going to eat? You know, I was in Kansas <laughs> two days ago. And I was like, this sucks. Like there is nothing that isn't like huge and gross in a franchise, except for my clients, you know, they're, they're making, you know, it's not exactly, I'm not sure I'd put like gravy on my bagels normally, but it was, it was just, it was pretty amazing that she's doing this. You know, she decided to put these exceptional bagels. And then she has this young baker who's making these incredible bars and my client's 71 years old. So I'm like, you know, do you tell people how good this stuff is? Like, I really feel like you need to be out there because no, you know, they see the sign and they're going through the drive through but somebody needs to be the one who's really saying, well, look what we're making. 
this is so exceptional and this is why you know without giving away all the secrets mm -hmm. and um and that's another thing i work with my clients on is you know how do you sell honestly right you upsell your stuff but hey you see someone you see the bill's only 10 bucks you know they can put in 20 tell them that you got some bagels and some schmears that you're making and you know and let me tell you why these are so great so i try to teach my clients to teach their employees to really be you know the ones who are out there promoting and um and i i would say 80% of my clients i've really become friends with i mean it's just this amazing set of relationships um Chuck, I see, I see Chuck's hand. Yeah, just one, okay. one question. Look, breath, yeah. while you take a breath, I take a breath. Beth, your model is like The Prophet. I don't know if you've ever watched The Prophet on television, right? No. The Prophet, have you seen that show? <laughs> yeah, no, oh, but I've seen, me, um, the, I've seen the billboard up on the West Side yeah, Highway. It's just like The Prophet. You're yeah. just like The Prophet. He's got, you know, he's an entrepreneur and he knows what he's doing like you do. And he goes and swoops in. And somebody, and he's, he buys part of the business, invests in the business, but you're like the profit. So I'll, uh, Tim, if you wouldn't mind, if you can, uh, Tim's been doing a good job in finding everything, if you can reference the profit. But I wanted to ask, Beth, what's the, so you've been talking about bagels, but then you just talked about schmears and stuff. So the, I'm here in South Florida, yeah. huge Jewish population. So, you know, we always do, we always see, you know, locks, et cetera. So, What's like the what's a good average sales price for a transaction, and where's the profit? Is it in the schmear? Is it in the coffee? Where's the where they where they're making money? So they're making first bagels are mostly water, okay. For, even as flour goes <coughs> price, so the bagels themselves. So I have built these. Everything is spreadsheet based. So I have all my formulas, all my bagels, all the schmears, all the salads on these formulas that I built. But they also have a pricing component. So you put in the per pound cost and what that unit size is, whether it's the bagel or it's the schmear. And when I just a few years ago, the bagels were about 10 cents to make um, a really good, all natural, best ingredients bagel. I mean, that's just cost of goods. I'm not talking labor and everything else that comes in in another calculation. And people were selling them for maybe a buck buck 50. So it's pretty good margin on that. But now with all the increase in prices, there's still only 15 cents, you know, people, mm -hmm. because you're not paying more for the water for the most part, or not a lot more. Um, the things that really go that are hard to do are these little bakeries that are using butter and eggs and all of that stuff, because everything is a commodity within those products. Where a bagel, you have flour, water, yeast, malt, salt, that's it. And then whatever you're putting on top and inside. There are different qualities within that. The schmears are also, uh, cream cheese is really expensive. And I think people <laughs> underpriced their cream cheese. Um, but when you start doing mix-ins, you become a Ben and Jerry's basically. And I say to people, you, mm -hmm. you know, create your own flavors, put your label on it, your brand and sell that stuff and, and upsell it because there's not a whole lot of work in that. Um, and of course, coffee, the things where money is made are sandwiches, but they take work. So we've really I've been trying to figure out a way to like pre-make a sandwich without making it a pre-made sandwich. Like maybe it's pre-assembled and then the bagel goes on. Yeah. Afterwards. Yes. Um, and the, the big money makers are catering because you're getting your full retail price, but you're not smearing every bagel or anything. You're just putting in the. Yep. you know, Got the it. bucket of, of cream Got cheese with the little container of cream cheese. Um, it, it's really, it's a very, uh, the thing about bagels, unlike a restaurant, um, and I tell my clients, you keep it simple, keep your menu simple. You do not have to be everything to everyone. They wanted me to make pumpkin bagels and I tried and they were so awful. I was like, a pumpkin bagel should not exist. It's like, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's wrong. There's everything wrong about a pumpkin bagel. You can put the pumpkin pumpkin pie spices in the cream cheeses or whatever, but that's a distraction. So people get distracted. They get distracted by the rainbow bagels. They get distracted by the blueberry bagels. I'm like, stick with the simple stuff that, you, that you're not spending extra time and your $20 an hour labor on and make it better than anybody else and just keep selling that. And so that's that's what I work on. John Stewart recently apologized for the blueberry bagel, or more appropriately, he said that wasn't us. 
That was in our committee. That was that was different people. That wasn't the Jews. <laughs> well, I get this with the and bagel. I actually made a um, I made a chocolate chocolate chip bagel, and I gave it to a good friend of mine, Harvey Leeds, who is like a former senior VP of Sony Epic. I have like these crazy people like circling around me because of bagels. So I have this whole like weird like orbit of bagel obsessed people, and he's one of them. And when I offered him the chocolate chocolate bagel, he got. He was like, I am so disgusted. And then when he tried it, he was like, oh, maybe you should just focus on these. I'm like, no, I'm not going to. I just wanted to. Um, but yeah. Hey, I, can, can I ask a question, Beth, sure. of your husband? Yes, of course. Just, Tim, Tim, can I can I ask you? So when Beth started this journey. Did this seem totally consistent with who she, you know, who you knew her to be? Or was this like a, a revelation in some way? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's a great question. Uh, no, I'd say it was it was incredibly consistent with who she she was, but but watching her Good answer, evolve dude. with this has been um, you know an education. It's been because uh, she has evolved incredibly over the last well, however many years this is i've lost count but um so it's, yeah so I, it is very consistent with who she is as a person i think uh, the the i'm gonna thank tim for this so i you know i was i'm in this little warehouse doing this and it and our sign is spray painted byob <laughs> and so and it's behind this like metal fence that's just falling apart and the building should be condemned, but it doesn't cost me much. So, um, you know, I, I was like, you know, no one's ever gonna find out about me. And then, a, a gra I mean, Tim can tell the story, but a graduate from just before COVID, you can tell this story, Tim. Go ahead. Uh, about sure. I, I was at an event at Vassar with an alum who was a writer and uh, we were sitting at dinner together and we were just getting to know each other and i told him beth's story and he said this is amazing i want to pitch this to my to my company and he worked for a company called cheddar a business a business magazine online mm -hmm. and um and he said could i get in touch with beth so i put them in touch with each other and he interviewed beth or talked with beth and then he pitched the story to his editor and they said nope not interested and shortly thereafter he was that was the lockdowns and it was quiet lockdown. yeah and he left he left cheddar he left and he went out on his own and he freelanced and he decided to pitch the story to the new york times and met with the food editor of the new york times and he pitched the story and he um he said if you can verify that that what she's told you is true i'm interested and that's that took her to a whole new level when they published that article. So that was the front, front was page a, of the food section of the New York Times. And it was a read of the day and a read of yes. the week. And yeah. I got it in my and feed. Instagram. I, we were I like, got it in my New York Times feed. And I was like, Beth George, wait a minute. I, I know her. Yeah, and it was and totally was like really that. Cool. It was like, and and I like had to go look and I looked at the picture. I'm like, yeah, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's and, that? And and what made the story, I thought, extra sweet it was was also his first New York Times byline. So he, yeah. it was like a win-win all around. Really cool. Yeah, and then he got a really good job after that. So he, um, but it just, that changed my life, I, I have to say, because, I, and I wasn't, and I was telling David this, I wasn't prepared. I, so people kept saying, oh, you know, where are you going to be in the Times? I'm like, I don't know, maybe a mention. I, I just, like, I wasn't focused on what he was telling me. And, you know, he came in with his phone camera and I'm like, oh, this is fun, you know? And then they sent in this really famous photographer and I was like, holy shit, this is gonna, something's I mean, going on, something's going on. And then when that hit, um, you know, I would get like a hundred emails a day. It was, I was not prepared because- So a hundred emails a day from people saying they wanted to uh, start a business, people, what, all what different things it? crazy yeah. like i would get you know some people want to start businesses i've been locked down i want to do this you're oh, you're like a dream come true other people were like 
hey, do you have gluten-free bagels? I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, just go. <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then I'd get, you know, hey, can I get some? Can I come to your store? I'm like, I don't have a store. So it just, and then, then like CBS, ABC, right. NBC. I saw you, Martha Marshall. Teichner. It was Martha Teichner, right? Was it her? Or... It was, yes, Martha Teichner. Yes, yes. Well, and, and you got to tell the here. story. You got the call from NBC and CBS on the same day, and yeah, you had great. to choose. And you had to choose. you The so Today good. Show or the Good Morning America? You got to pick one. <laughs> yeah. So, so we ran into Martha Teichner in our local Whole Foods. We oh. live in, in, which is in Chelsea. We live in Flatiron. And I actually pitched her on Dine Out with us. This was about this was during the lockdown, and I had no launch date because we didn't know what was going to happen with food planning, of course. But she was like, "Well, that's really interesting. You should contact me when the time comes." So I think my calling card is going to be, "Hey, I'm Beth George's classmate," and well, uh, no, I do therefore, know. I have all the contact information if you want to talk to the producer because I, you know, the other thing okay, hey, I do. Is that <laughs> the producers are all treated like shit. They're treated like, you know water boys or whatever they just don't they don't treat anybody they just are like they treat they're just you know whatever my stepmother was actually hired as the first features producer for cnn back in the 70s and she and, produced peter jennings and i mean she went down there she got this call from this crazy southern atlanta and the guy i worked for him reese schoenfeld like hey we're starting this 24-hour cable network and we're living in lincoln she'd been producing peter jennings in dc before that but you know producers i mean i think it's a little different now i think back then the well, producers they're, young, were really they're very stuck. young you yeah. know like in their yeah. 20s these women just trying to mostly it was women i met but what i and also the um the photographers and the film crew so i always feed everybody so i made sure that i got like really good sliced meats none of this like boar's head stuff the bagels and everything and i would feed everybody every day who came in because we had days of filming and other things. And that just set the stage. And it didn't even occur to me that they would like me even more because of that. But because it's just what I've been taught to do is feed people. So um, so I'm still in contact with a lot, you know, they, I think they would- you should connect. I wanna show you my spreadsheet too, because you'll, when you were talking about your spreadsheet, I was thinking about the one I built for this business, which is- But, you know, I could use some people as, app what? experience because what i have is still very rudimentary so there there's room for growth in what i do um we should get together Beth. i mean i'm in show i'm in i'm in 2006 so, we so should we're in out. we're in angle i'm in englewood so um uh, i don't get to drive out of the city often enough so i'll be I, happy yeah. to come okay come and see you yeah can, when i make bagels <laughs> come by i but, can't um, eat bagels anymore unfortunately i'm diabetic now but i can certainly enjoy smelling them I, yeah, the uh, I'll I'm gonna try to make a a low you know well there are other things that I'll try to make along the way, yeah, but okay. my but my next steps here are um you know I I really want my own place Tim knows this has known this forever I really would love to have my own building and I'm working on a project I don't know the building that I'm looking at has a lot of problems. But where it's located and kind of the fact that it, my goal is to build an entrepreneurial center where I can teach these people, you know, pay me the big price to kind of afford this, but then also like train employees on how to be good employees like and train then there and also the space, if I get the space. Uh, will accommodate there's like 5000 square feet on the first floor and there are multiple floors. Um, I'd like to put in. Uh, like little kiosks for these other businesses that are just these cottage businesses where they have the licenses to do this in New York and then, um, you know, charge very, you know, no, if I can get like 10 and I charge them $500 rent each, then it's going to pay for the building, you know, that kind of thing. But then it's, but then it's something they can afford. Um, and we should off limit. I literally just before I got on closed on a loan, a community reinvestment act loan involving some property owned in California, uh, First Republic and the banks are chartered and they're and I got a three and a half percent loan um, for a surprising amount of money, like today in a, in a six seven percent interest mortgage environment. And so if you've got something that fits their screens, yeah, and that sounds like it really would. 
um, the terms, I mean, they have their charter, so they get they get brownie points from the regulators for doing these. No, they probably have a quota of something they have to do. But when I went and approached them for just a commercial mortgage, they just asked me like through the loan officer asked me three questions. She said, well, our regular program is like five and a half percent. This was like three months ago when we started working yeah. on it. And she said, but I can get you this three and a half percent loan, this and the other thing. And I was like, so let's talk, you know, th there's ways to finance that. And I was actually thinking about when you're talking about the rent expense, because if somebody has I mean, hundred thousand dollars, might not be enough. But if you've got enough to put down on a property, and you could take out that you rent it from yourself. Yep, that's you what I plan on. I plan to get the mortgage it. interest deduction. You can get commercial yep. mortgage even in even in the states Trump fucked with yeah. the with the. But you still get commercial. So we ran our apartment in New York, and I ran out a property in California, and the rents are roughly the same, but the tax benefit cuts the price in half. It's just a stupid thing, a stupid function of the tax code. Mm -hmm. but there's lots of things you can do to do some financial engineering around lowering that cash flow, that 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 cash flow burden that you were talking about. And a lot of it's just signing paper at the end of the day. Like you have good credit and you got a little bit of a nest egg. Yep. Got both. And you get yeah. the banker who needs to do the kind of deal that you need, right? It's really just a matter of finding the match. So not just for you, but for the folks that you advise. There's a lot of really creative financing options out there. If you, you know, I'm, if I can cut in. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. But I'd like to get back to who your clients are, Beth, because mm -hmm. I learned the other day that in the last 18 months, your clients opened 24 shops, which is just amazing. And, yeah, it gives me chills when you say that. And so, and, and we've talked a little bit about grit and how much when you first meet a client do you have a pretty good sense of whether they're going to be able to make this work or not and are you screening people to you know just to say you know are you are you really ready to do this talk more about your clients if you would so early on you know when the onslaught came on after the um after the the press the initial press i wasn't as selective and now i'm very selective so i do a lot of screening um <clears throat> i don't get i don't have them prove their finances to me but you know pretty much i can figure it out now you know that somebody has the wherewithal to do it so i usually have three to four calls with someone before they we either decide it's not going to work or they sign on um and um, so I have a real range of clients. So I have, um, let's see, I have three or four people who are in the financial world. One of the funny stories is, I can't remember which which outlet it was. Um, it's a pretty famous, you know, just finance house. And it turns out that two of my clients were from it, but neither one knew that they were coming to me. And they they are, they worked at different offices. <laughs> And they met at the water fountain and the guy's like, I'm leaving. He goes, what are you doing? I'm doing bagels. <laughs> the other guy's like, what are, you, are you going to BYOB? And he's like, yeah. So it turns out that these two, and they actually ended up opening at the same time, one in Pennsylvania and one in uh, North Carolina. I have, an, I have other clients who are just like, just gritty entrepreneurs. This is woman who just is really scrappy. And she started her own ice cream company. Um, and she just decided, and she learned it herself, and she decided she didn't want to go through that learning curve, so she hired me. She's already put in a second store within a year. Um, I have a, another guy in Idaho. He um, is originally from California, and he was like one of the world's fewest uh, lettuce cultivators. Um, I have a couple in South Carolina who he was, God, I think he was the CEO for Nike Europe. I'm going to guess. And he, he and they had a lot of money and they live in Hilton Head and they were tired of what was going on in Hilton Head with all the, uh, they were with the Gullah <coughs> there. Um, people were losing their farms that they had gotten, you know, post, post, um, you know, uh, emancipation from mm -hmm. the families because no one was buying their produce. So they decided to build a supermarket in Bluffton. And the whole goal was to provide local foods there. But the guy is the guy who did it. So they've, they bring in, they're creating a stream of um, commerce for these farms. It's a really amazing place. It's called um, 
low country fresh. But the the guy who's doing he's Jewish from Chicago and he just wanted to make bagels. So he has this really great chef, but the chef couldn't do bagels. So they had me come down and do that. Um, you know, they're just all different kinds of people. Some, I have a few people who really messed up, uh, only two, I would say. And one of them was fully capable of doing it, but just didn't have the right attitude. And another couple did uh, zero due diligence and just felt they could do it. And I guess I expected kind of a higher level of understanding because they're both professionals. So I am much more um, blunt with people now. I'd prefer that they don't sign on with me if they're not going to be able to pull it off. So of the 24 that opened, um, about three are opening second stores within the first year. Um, I would say 80% are profitable within their first year. You know, they're paying their bills and they're paying themselves. It doesn't mean they've paid off everything. And one guy closed and he was the one he's, pretty well off. And he just, he just didn't, he wasn't cut out for this. He was from a fortune 500 company and he was in his late sixties and he wanted his son to do this with him. And his son didn't want to have anything to do with him. And, you know, it just, so, but I think that's a pretty good track record over the past, um, you know, year and a half, just in the past, I wasn't traveling a lot before because I was so busy teaching on site, but now people are asking me to come out to their places and kind of do a once over. And I went to a place out in San Antonio and they are great. They're really funny. It's called Bubby's uh, Soul Food Jewish Deli. And this uh, husband and husband couple um, are, but you know, and they were making this great food, but there was a problem with the bagels. And I walk in and the mixer was mixing backwards for a year. Oh, shit. Why didn't somebody notice this? <laughs> you know, you can't mix something backwards because the dough goes up. And so that taught me that every time I'm going to have somebody do a video of their mixer for me, if I haven't made it there. So like I learned something new two weeks ago. Um, so there are just, different little things that can happen or this um I have this other client I went to visit she's 71 years old her husband's in Alzheimer's care and she has just she was a you know in corporate world for years and then left and decided to open up these coffee shops which are great and she brought in bagels and she said to me they're just dry Beth and I said I'm coming out there I just have to see what's going on and I was able to walk through and pinpoint you know Okay, vent over the bagel machine, oven here, you know, this is happening, coolers blowing too much air, because it was, it was not a place that we helped build, it was a place that already existed. And we fixed it by, <laughs> I know I'm not answering the full question, but we fixed this by getting a $28 humidifier and putting it underneath a rack of bagels. So as the dough is trying to rise it's got a moisture content and it's warm so you know people come in with all different experiences and then it's you know it's really my responsibility to hopefully make it all work for them even if we have to jerry rig which we do often um most everybody who i talk to or they just write me these notes just thanking me you know that they've left kind of this corporate drag they were in that they were just miserable in and they feel alive and whole and they can't believe it when people are you know coming in and thanking them for making such a great product i can't that has got to just give you such immense <laughs> satisfaction i i i can't imagine i think it's, that's just so it, very cool when it gives me chills when i talk about it because sometimes i'm so stressed like when i was doing i will never do 24 in a year and a half again because <laughs> I won't do that because I didn't sleep. I had. Oh, but everybody on this call is going to be signing up with you. <laughs> uh. but, but I I won't do that again. And so I'm taking a one, eight, one a month average because I want to be able to give them my attention when I'm, you know, not when I'm exhausted. And there were times I was like, you know, I can't answer that question. Come on. You don't know why your bagel's dry. What's wrong with you? And then, you know, go, okay, that's why I'm here. Um, so I just, it's 
and I get to know their families, which is really fun too, right. people with the younger kids. Um, but people seem to really love that they've made this switch. Um, and, you know, th two and a half years ago, I was asked to write a book and I don't know if they want me to write it anymore. It was Simon and Schuster, but I just, I, I couldn't, I started writing it. The first, the intro was great. And then I rewrote it. And then I was going to write the stories about each person, but they're, they're pretty, sometimes they're really stressful stories. Mm. You know, um, we, we go through a lot together and it would really like not tell the story. If I told the whole story, if I just showed the sweetness, but people don't want the dirty laundry out there, you know? So, or just the stresses that they've gone through. That's their story to tell if they want right, to. Right. Beth, in, in this, in this chat, I put the link to the prophet. You've got to watch it. It's a, it's, it was on CNBC. You've got to watch mm -hmm. a couple of them because he does a lot of the same stuff, but it's, it's not just bagels with different businesses, but there's infighting, bickering, et cetera. But also <laughs> sometimes it makes out. And then he also invests. Let me ask you, do you, inv have you invested with any no, of these folks? No, because I, you know, okay. The other side of me is I'm a lawyer and I wanted to keep like <laughs> legal lives different. So my contracts say, I'm not a part of this business. I have no liability there's an indemnification clause if you get sued and i get drawn in you're covering me like i really keep myself distant from that um and it really does make it less stressful for me that way um and i and i don't make that much money off of it right now to be an investor i think if i have my own space that things are going to shift in that way because right now i'm really just at the mercy of these other people where my space is and you know I don't have to recommend their equipment, but we're using their equipment. I would like to be able to be more of a free agent. Um, and I think once I have my own space, I can see other things happening. It's just okay. not. Okay. Got it. Anybody else have any questions? Well, Beth, you talked about uh, your legal background and I saw that Allison asked a question. Allison, did that, did that address the question you had about sort of the, the law? school background? I mean, there's so many interesting parts of Beth's life that have come together in a way that's very surprising. And so Beth, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about what about your Bates education prepared you to be okay. such an amazing entrepreneurial woman? And then where does the law piece all fit into all of this? So, so Bates, you know, and I talk about this some, but I went into Bates not knowing what I was doing. My parents are both children of immigrants from uh, the Middle East and that their parents came over around 1912. So my parents were not native English speakers, even though that's all they spoke around us. Like they refused to teach us Arabic. So a lot, and then my father, my parents owned this business in Williamstown, Mass. Um, it was a swimming pool and people would come to our home to swim. My mother was 24 years old when she walked into the place and said, I want this. And my father was so in love with her. He's like, Okay, you know, and they had no idea what they were doing. So, um, so my first kind of inspiration was then, you know, then, and then with Bates, Bates taught me things I didn't learn at home. And that's how to be like an analytical thinker, you know, to organize, to be, you know, um, to be able to, um, you know, it, it just, I just had so much more, by the time I graduated from the time I came in, my intellect had matured. And that helped me then articulate things better when I needed to do whatever it was. So I left Bates and I went to New York City and I worked for the March of Dimes and I worked for a law firm. And each time it was interesting that I was able to see why they hired me because I ended up getting in management positions. And each time it was, she's a really good writer. And I certainly, I don't think I got that from high school. I think I got that from Bates when I got some of my C's and got pissed off about it. But <laughs> I, that I was, you know, there was like honest, um, constructive teaching to get me to organize my thoughts. And then when I went on, then I was worked in New York City for several years. So I really kind of, thank Bates for that leap 
into New York because, you know, I had never left Williamstown, all 6,000 people. Um, and then it was Spencer's, uh, Spencer's life. I mean, I'm going to get all choked up about this, but I couldn't imagine him ending up like my clients. Um, and I was, what it was, was when I left law school, I worked for uh, first for the chief justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And then, but two weeks at, two weeks after I graduated from law school, we had Emma, our first child. So I was balancing, you know, being a mom and, um, you know, law. Then I went to a corporate law firm and I really did not like that world, but I learned a lot. And then Tim, I was like, I got to get out of here, Tim. <laughs> get us out of New Hampshire. So it was our 10th reunion at Bates and Tim got off. I, we went, I said, I bet you they'll offer you a job. And they offered him a job at Bates. Thank you, Tim. So, um, and then from there, I, I started my own practice. And that's when I first became an entrepreneurial lawyer. And I was like, I've got to be able to spend time with these kids. And so Spencer, I got my law. Uh, I could practice starting in uh, 1996. And then he was born in 1997. And from the moment he was born, he had health problems and other issues. And I started doing child advocacy work and I was watching what was happening to these kids in this system. And when I saw Spencer going in that direction, I knew I had to act. And so it's, so it's, it's really the advocacy in me that became this baker. Cause I was like, we have to, there is there is better stuff out there. Kids can eat better. We can't just keep, you know, stuffing ourselves and forcing all this fake food on everybody. And mm -hmm. then from that, New York. And then as things, I guess the thing I learned from all sorts of experiences, my parents, is when things aren't going exactly in the direction you want, don't give up. Just use what you have and find plan B and C and D. And that's kind of what I did. And then everything I learned along the way just kind of led up to this. And, you know, I learned there are times I would want to give up on myself and I wouldn't. But I guess, and I have to rem remember, and Tim and I talk about this, that our biggest success was Spencer. I mean, all of our kids, but Spencer was really in that place where we could have lost him um, to something that would have made his life very difficult. And he is just, you know, he got honors. He graduated from honors with, uh, from Stevens Institute of Technology and Chemical Engineering. And um, it's done some really cool things. And, you know, being here, the cool, one of the cool things is he helps me on the side with my recipes when something gets really complicated. So we were doing work in Ethiopia and um, Ethiopia does not allow any import of flour. So, so flour, the bagel flour has to be 14% protein and they only had 9% protein. And I, and I had a protein booster, but I didn't know how much to put in to make it right. And I said to Spencer, here are the variables. You know, this protein booster has this amount of protein. This flour has this amount of protein and I need to get to this amount. And within five minutes, he built a spreadsheet so that now for any of my international clients, we can build their flour and then blend it, blend in other things, make it a big little flour. So that's kind of cool. But I have relationships with the ingredient companies. I have relationships with the equipment companies. I travel all over testing ovens. Um, and I just, anytime I have an opportunity to learn something new within this world, I try to learn it. Uh, I know a little about a lot um, and then we get the experts involved. So at least I know the questions to ask. And that, that also is from Bates and mm -hmm. law school. Beth, it is an incredible story. And I think others would join me in saying, we hope you'll write it down. It, it sounds like you're pretty busy right now, but <laughs> you, you've got to capture this at some point. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us. Well, they, they do not want a memoir. They want like a cookbook with people's little stories. So I may just write my own outside of that publishing house. Can you drop your email address in the chat? Yeah, I'll put my, my um, Gmail rather than my 
uh, my ba uh, my ba BYOB bagels one because I don't get that one on my phone. Well, mine, mine's in there if you want to email me, if, whatever you want to do, but I'd like to. I'll do it. I, we have a lot to talk about. And I'm going to turn this over, I think, to Allison and Heather, who are going to give us a preview. Also, I think Bates will send us uh, links to the videos that were on CBS Sunday Morning and ABC News. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Allison and Heather. Thanks again, Beth. Great to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Thanks. Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Beth. Two thumbs up. Fantastic. <laughs> Heather, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thank you, Beth. Okay. For wonderful. That was a fabulous conversation. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Beth. Very interesting. Um, well, first off, just want to thank everybody for joining in. Uh, we've been having lots of fun putting these together, and also we'll love to thank Meredith from Bates um, for being our stalwart support system behind the scenes and making sure that all the advertising and so on gets done through um date communication and engagement office and i never know exactly what the name of your department is marita but we couldn't do it without them and i also appreciate that she's got a couple little ones at home and so she's giving up her evening to be with us tonight um and um so we're we don't have all the details worked out yet but our next bob chat so to speak will be a trivia night so i'm trying to organize um with a couple of classmates who used to be DJs with WRBC. I don't know if anybody remembers the WRBC trivia night that we used to do. So we'll try and do something um, along those lines, but we've, um, as soon as we get land, as soon as we get- um, I, I uh, figured there'd still be a few people on the call. Why not right. join you know, late? You know. Um, <laughs> So as soon as we get the dates nailed down and some of the details, we'll be sharing those in the new year so people can um, can register for that. So I think what we'll end up doing is um, using, uh, um, I always forget the name of it, Kahoot, my kids are telling me the bag, using the Kahoot platform so we can actually make it a little bit of a competition and we'll keep score and people can make teams if they want. So that's kind of the thought there. But if anybody has, if anybody wants to volunteer, to run that that would be great i've i've asked a couple people so we're we're still waiting on details but uh and heather do note that this is our first bob chat that comes with with door prizes so yes 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 we will have prizes don't know what yet we'll have to talk to meredith a little bit more about what we can get i think it's bagels <laughs> isn't it bagels yeah yeah they're going to be base branded bagels something I like will, that yeah someday you know i'd feel more comfortable in my space but if it's not we can make bagels at the factory. I mean, I only know how to make like 300 bagels at a time. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's just, it's too much work. Beth so, George, yeah. I'm so sorry. I had plans tonight. I was trying to catch the tail ends. Uh, who is, who? This is Lance. Oh, hey, Lance, how are you? I'm doing well. I, mean, I didn't what know are you, you were out still... walking the dog or something there, Lance. No, I just left a dinner engagement, so okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm in my car now, though, so I just needed to okay. just ha have a quick shout out. Oh, we still got a lot of people on the call. Very cool. Yeah. So, Eric, I agree. I remember as well. I wasn't one of the people that broke in to uh, get information, but it would be like the name of somebody on a particular trophy in the trophy case in a certain building that you had to go try and find or call a bar down in Boston to find out what the name of their top shelf vodka was or something like that. And of course we didn't have the internet. So we were trying to figure it all out. People would would kind of borrow reference books from the library and take them out so they could have things to look up. Yeah, it was uh, and an all night kind of thing as I recall also. It was, uh, I, I always thought it was lots of fun. So I thought it'd be fun to try it again. So, um, so I wish everybody awesome. happy holiday season. I know there's a lot of different ones coming up in the next couple months. So whichever one or many that you celebrate with your friends and family, I hope they are happy and healthy. And um, anybody else have anything they would like to add or? No, I think the thing that you brought up to me and Tim always brings up is just the support for the college to mm -hmm. remember. And Tim does, Tim, thank you for doing that for me. <laughs> um, 
he knows the importance of that. If it's not even just the num, you know, the actual amount, which is the number. Yeah, I. Well, Erica's left, but I have vowed that we're going to beat the class of '86 this year in terms of participation. So we're actually getting close. To, you know, the numbers are small enough that it only takes a few more to get us up a few percentage points. Um, and uh, but we've done really well the last couple of years in, in greater than 50% participation for our class, which is pretty good for the number of years out we are from from uh, graduation. And um, yeah, it does make a difference. Heather, I think Heather, it's, Heather, yeah. Heather, what do you think? What What do you think we need to hit in order to beat um, the class of '86? I have to look at the um, the leaderboard, but I think they had like 56 percent or something like that last year. I mean, they beat us by a few percentage points for sure. Got it. Okay. We beat them in dollars, but they beat us in people. So, I have to make yeah. sure I have my name. Now yeah. I feel like, okay. <laughs> I don't know if anybody saw in the news today. And I mean, it's in terms of how important keeping the, you know, the incoming revenue up to the school. And I mean, obviously there's many parts and pieces to it, but Casanova College, in the greater Syracuse area just announced, um, or Syracuse Ithaca area just announced today that they're closing after almost 200 years. So it's Bye, really- everybody. Thank you, I gotta yeah. jump. Thank you so much. Great, great, yeah. great event. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. So these small liberal arts colleges, I think as people predicted when a lot of things were going to virtual classes and, and that that online platform looking to be feasible that some of these smaller schools aren't going to make it and that's what we're going to start to see so at any rate so I think yep keep keep the donations coming in that's definitely helpful. Thanks Beth for that reminder and Beth thank you so much you were so terrific tonight it was so inspiring to hear from you um, as we know there's lots of women and men I guess I know that have had just brilliant <laughs> careers in the second yeah. parts of their lives. And you're just, it's inspiring to see what you're building and continuing to build. And you're just, it seems like you're just starting to hit your stride. So yeah. we're cheering you on. Thanks. And I really appreciate being able to talk about this in the classmates. Well, so. Thank you very much for agreeing to it. We appreciate it very much. It's yep. a lonely place being an entrepreneur. You know? I mean, lonely <laughs> and kind of making all these decisions yeah. anyway. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, okay. Stephen. Good night.